Ouch. Ooh, look at that. Man ups on, there are much worse things that can bite you. It's time for investigation. Ouch. As a doctor, my specialty is tropical medicine, and it takes me all over the world. But actually, one of the best places to study it is right here in the UK at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And I'm going to show you what they keep in the basement. Because some countries have tropical warm temperatures, they're just the right conditions for disease-spreading animals to thrive and multiply. In this room are 8,000 of one of the deadliest animals in the world. And no, this is not a tank full of great white sharks. These are sexy flies. Oh! Setsi flies live in 35 countries across Africa. When they bite a human, they cause a fatal disease called sleeping sickness by injecting a nasty parasite. This laboratory in Liverpool is trying to find a cure to help millions of people. This is Dr Alvaro Acosta Serrano. He's the chief scientist who looks after the flies, and they're hungry. He's just served up some blood for them to feed on so he can research their habits. This is a special sheet that's heated so the flies think it's real skin. Underneath the skin, is animal blood. And so the flies bite through the skin and drink the blood as they would in real life. Look at those bellies. They're red because they're full of blood. Lovely. How often do you have to feed the flies? Every other day. Every other day. So you've basically got 8,000 pet flies in the basement that need feeding every two days. That is a lot of work. So I thought I'd help out Dr Alvaro and feed one of the flies by letting it bite me right now. But don't worry, these flies are sterile which means they don't carry any disease. So this fly is sucking up my blood through its proboscis, that long straw-like thing at the front. So how much blood is he going to drink? It's going to take at least twice his own weight. Twice his own weight. OK, so that is the equivalent of me drinking 300 pints of milk for breakfast. So while he's eating, he's leaving a sort of substance on my arm. What is that? It's just getting rid of the waste of the, from, from blood. So I'm not just being eaten, this fly is also having a poo on me. Nice. And look at how much its body has grown in just five minutes. It's full of my blood. And if this was a wild fly and it was carrying the parasite, it could make me very sick indeed. This green and yellow stuff is blood under a special microscope. But see those wriggly worm things? They're the parasites that the Setsi fly injects. And those parasites multiply in the bloodstream and make the patient feel extremely unwell. And then they move to the central nervous system, to the brain, where they multiply further. The patient feels drowsy, increasingly sleepy, and over the course of weeks to a month, they die. That's why it's so important that the team study the flies and find out more about the parasites to stop them from causing people harm. At the moment, there's no vaccine to prevent sleeping sickness, and the only way they can keep the disease at bay is by setting up giant fly traps. So the investigation for Dr Alvaro and his team must continue. My experience with sexy flies here in Liverpool has been fascinating. Even being bitten was quite fun. But in Africa, they spread one of the most fatal diseases known to man. And that's why the work done by Alvaro and his team is so important. I hear, Chris, that you're off to visit some of the world's most dangerous creatures, so I brought you some safety goggles. I've got cushions to defend yourself against teeth and claws. And I have a pasta strainer for your head. Zand, I don't think any of this is helpful or necessary. Well, better safe than sorry, Chris. After all, if you didn't come back, who'd be around to cook me my favourite spaghetti bolognese? I think it's time for investigation out. So, today, I'm looking for one of the world's deadliest creatures. It's roamed the Earth for over 200 million years. Ooh, I know. It has to be the deadly T-Rex. Don't be ridiculous, son. T-Rex are extinct. What about a snake? No, it's not a snake. The creature I'm talking about can drink up to three times its own body weight in blood. I've got it. It's a mosquito. Mosquitoes are small insects which can give you a nip. You've probably been bitten by one. In some countries, mosquitoes are dangerous because they transmit infectious diseases like dengue fever and malaria to humans when they bite us. In the UK, mosquito bites are generally pretty harmless, just a bit itchy and uncomfortable. 
but in fact remarkably little is known about our local mosquito population. Has it started to change, for example? Could it now contain mosquitoes which might transmit disease? To find out, I'm meeting some of the only scientists researching mosquitoes in the UK. Um, excuse me, do you know where there are any scientists around here? Dr Chris, we are the scientists. You are the scientists? Well, I was expecting them to be a bit older. Right, well, what do I need? Have you brought your mosquito larvae retrieval device? Uh, have you got one I can borrow? Yeah, you can use this one. Brilliant, thank you, Kiri. It's like a piece of bamboo with a measuring jug on the end of it. Come on, Chris, let's go. Why have we come to these ponds to look for mosquitoes? So they lay their eggs in water, they then become pupa, and then they turn into larvae. So it's sort of like a caterpillar that lives in water. Why are you guys interested in looking at the mosquito larvae? Because we can classify them and see if they're mosquitoes that can carry it, like malaria, dengue fever, things like that. Did you know there are currently 34 species of mosquito in the UK? Luckily, none of them carry dangerous diseases, but there are three and a half thousand species worldwide, so it's important to check whether new ones have arrived. So what am I looking for in the water? You're looking for little black bobbly things. Oh, I see. Is it these, these things that are wriggling around? Yeah. So how are we going to tell what species these are? So we're going to put them in one of the containers and then take them back to the lab and we will classify them under the microscope. Wow, look at that. Up close, they look quite frightening. Maya and Asma are using an identification chart to work out which type of mosquito we caught. Is this the developed head? That's the thorax. OK. And then that's its little air pipe, is it? That's how it yeah. breeds. So unlike you, a mosquito larvae breathes through kind of its bottom. Is that yeah. right? Well, you can see it has one tuft of hair, and it says on the identification chart, Aedes has one tuft of hair. Some kinds of mosquitoes can carry diseases. Can you tell if this is one of those? Well, it's hard to identify if it could until it's an adult mosquito. So you're going to let the larvae grow into an adult, and then you'll be able to tell it? Yeah. With climate change meaning the UK is getting hotter, this work is more important than ever. What's incredible about this research is it will enable us to know if there are any mosquitoes in the UK that are spreading disease. And if we know about them, we can prepare for any dangers. And not only that, but the research here, tracking one of the deadliest creatures on Earth, is being done by kids your age. How much does the average adult skin weigh? Is it as much as A, one fully grown pug dog, B, two newborn babies, or C, three pineapples? The answer is C. Three pineapples weigh just under three kilos, and so does the average adult skin. Ouch. Zand. Yes? Hold this. Ah! A plastic snake! These things are terrifying. Yes, but what if the snake was real? This is a case for investigation. Ouch. As a doctor specialising in tropical medicine, I'm used to working in some exotic locations with dangerous creatures. But today, I'm on the top floor of the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And in fact, this is one of the most dangerous locations I've ever been in. Because on this floor are 180 of the world's deadliest snakes. There are many species of snake here, and each one is capable of delivering a potentially life-threatening dose of venom, a poisonous fluid snakes inject through their fangs. Now, if you're wondering who on earth would volunteer to work with these deadly snakes, meet Dr. Robert Harrison. Why are you keeping 180 venomous snakes in this room? We take venom from these snakes, and that venom is used to make medicines to treat people who would otherwise die from snake bite. That life-saving medicine is known as anti-venom, and it's actually made using the snake venom itself. The anti-venom medicine Dr. Robert and his team are helping to make in Liverpool is used to treat people 4,000 miles away in West Africa, where there are 36,000 deaths every year from snake venom. Meet Paul Rowley, an expert snake handler who's brought some snakes out of their habitat for us to see in action. Well, this is the Nigerian saw-scale viper, and it's the, amongst the most dangerous snakes in the world to man. 
even though they are small, they are an extremely dangerous snake. They do kill a lot of people. Because anti-venom medicine is made using snake venom, Dr. Robert and Paul have to collect that venom from the snake's mouth. But it's a dangerous business. When the snake bites the dish like this, the poisonous venom drips out of the fangs and is collected. It's a bit like milking a cow, and it doesn't hurt the snake. And Rob, what would happen if instead of a glass dish, this was human flesh? Once it gets into the blood, it causes terrific bleeding throughout the body. The poor patient is just bleeding from everywhere, from the nose, from the gums, from the eyes, and internally. For such a little snake, it can cause a lot of harm. And this small drop of venom that we've just collected is more than enough to kill a human being. But it's also enough to make the anti-venom that will save people's lives. If you're squeamish, look away now. This is a 12-year-old boy who was bitten on the foot by a Nigerian saw-scaled viper. He lost his big toe, but the anti-venom saved his life. Each snake has a different type of venom and needs its own anti-venom to be made. So, ready for another? This one is seriously fantastic. This is a Nigerian puff adder. So the snake has just bitten the mat, and that's just one of the problems of, of doing this, is this is a very, very tricky thing to do. This adder's venom has a different effect on the human body to the previous snake. Terrific destruction of the tissues around the bite. It just destroys the, the muscle and the skin. So this venom actually dissolves flesh Absolutely. and then it spreads around the body. And, and then it spreads around the body. Yeah. This is a seven-year-old boy who was bitten on the hand by a Nigerian puff adder while he was cutting grass. The venom caused blood-filled blisters to erupt, but he made a full recovery thanks to the anti-venom. But not all snakes release their venom by biting. This snake is extremely quick and it can spit its venom. And that's why it's called the spitting cobra. In fact, it can spit as far as two metres. And if it was to get in your eyes, it could blind you. So Dr Robert's got his face guard on, and I'm staying well away to let the experts collect the venom. Ooh. You're just milking the venom glands there. Just massaging the venom glands. Now, don't worry. It's highly unlikely you'll ever need the anti-venom being made here. We don't have any snakes like that in England, do we? We don't. We're really lucky we don't have anything like the, the cobras or the, or the puff adders and things like that. But we do have the British adder. And it it's, is actually a really quite important snake. There was a, a near-death case two years ago. So I when you're going out, just stay clear of these snakes. Don't handle them. Don't touch them. Leave them alone. Rob, I think after today, that advice is extremely obvious. I'm going to stay well back. <laughs> <laughs> that was spectacular. And remember, the venom that Rob and Paul risked their lives to collect today in Liverpool will be used to make anti-venom, and that will be used to save people who've been bitten by snakes in Africa. Ouch. And now to our lab. Are you ready for some incredible experiments? Stand aside, Chris. We're getting gross. Ah! We're going big. The bones are not buckling. And dangerous. <laughs> Remember, we can only do these experiments because we're doctors. Don't try this at home. Today, we're exploring being squeamish. Son, we are getting a lot of messages from grown-ups about some of our squeamish bits. Mm. Listen to this one. Dear Dr Chris and Dr Zand, why is your programme so disgusting? My children love it, but I have to watch through my fingers. Please, could you make it less gross? Zand, what have I said about eating in the lab? Um... What are you watching? These are our grossest moments. They're my favourite. I love the gross bits too, but they do make some people feel a bit squeamish. Now, feeling squeamish is a basic and important emotion. There are some things that turn almost everyone's tummies. Maggots, dog poo, dried sick on a pavement, a bogey smeared on the edge of a sink. But did you know that this is something that you learn and it develops as you get older? Babies, for example, aren't squeamish at all. Well, to put this idea to the test, we're going to need a baby. Give me one moment, Chris. Here you go, Chris. One baby. Zand, this is my baby. This is Lyra, your niece. Whatever. And we're going to need some of the most disgusting things we can think of. First up, worms. 
Here you go. Here's oh. some yummy worms. What do you think of that? Look at that. This is not a baby that's disgusted by a worm, is it? Fair enough. Next up, maggots. What this do you is think of really that? disgusting. Look at the move. She's got one in her hand. I mean, that is not a disgusted baby, is it? Right. If worms and maggots don't make you feel squeamish, Lyra, I'm going to pull out all the stops with this next thing. Let's see if Lyra is disgusted by Rose. What do you think of Rose? Lyra seems very, very unbothered by Rose, and she's not bothered by the most disgusting thing of all, Dr Zahn's beard and bogeys. Not disgusted by anything. <laughs> no, he's not Dada. I'm Dada. So all of those things might have made you feel a bit squeamish, but Lyra isn't reacting because she doesn't know how to feel squeamish. It's only as you get older and learn more about the world around you that you start to develop these feelings of squeamishness, usually about the same things that the adults around you don't like. So we're going to put this to the test and see what happens when you are truly grossed out. Thank you, Lyra. I think you're done. It's time to bring on some older guests who are cordially invited to our disgusting dinner. <laughs> Welcome to the Ouch Disgusting Dining Experience. Joining us are Lennon, Kitty and James. Three foolish, I mean lucky, ouchers. We are going to be serving a meal of delightfully disgusting dishes whilst they eat and we'll monitor their faces and heart rates so we can find out what feeling squeamish does to the body. Right, grubs up. Three, two, two one, one. Et voila. <laughs> Ta da! Oh. Oh. On the menu today, jellied eels. Crickets, Mapani worms, fish eggs, stinky blue cheese, and a giant Thai water bug. This food is totally safe. We expect empty plates at the end of the meal. Oh, I don't know. Are those flies? That, is that eggs? Those are fish eggs, yeah. Oh! Oh. Now, Kitty's prepared a little spoonful of fish eggs and cooked crickets. So why don't you have a go at that? Looking at someone else eating it is like you're eating it. Our ouchers have all been making yuck faces. Their noses and foreheads wrinkled, they stuck out their tongues. This signals you're feeling disgusted and warns other people not to touch what's there. <laughs> what is that? They made the yuck face because they have learnt that some things can be harmful, unlike Lyra, who hasn't learnt this yet. James is going to eat the water bug. Are you going to do it, James? Look how disgusting it is! James's pulse rate was 66, it's now 82. So even the thought of putting this into your mouth has started to make James's body prepare. He's having this thing called a fight or flight response. Oh. Your squeamish response is very similar to feeling afraid. Your heart rate increases, so you're ready to run away from whatever might be harmful. How's it going? I'm good. It's good. I don't believe you. Because <laughs> you're making your yuck face, you're squinting your eyes. Dessert time. Will our chocolate-covered mealworms and worm lollies also make our ouchers feel squeamish? Kitty, you're eating the chocolate with the mealworms on it. That's not bothering you? No. After our disgusting main course, sweets with a few insects don't seem so bad. Our ouchers learned from each other that they could try different things. So because they saw each other eating bugs, their squeamish feelings decreased because they learned the food wasn't harmful. Who's had this? Len's been licking that. Kitty, you'll eat the chocolate with the maggots, but you won't have the lollipop that Lennon's licked. Yeah. Why do you think you won't do that? His germs are on it. So that's an important point, is that there are some things that almost everyone is disgusted by. Poo and body fluids, particularly. Some things are more likely to make you squeamish. They smell strong or they're unfamiliar. But it's good to challenge it sometimes so you don't miss out on fun experiences like eating lollipops with worms in them. So we've shown you that squeamish feelings are a defence mechanism that you learn as you get older. And that your body's response is a lot like fear, increasing your heart rate, putting you into fight or flight mode. You know, Zand, I feel quite inspired by our ouchers today, and it occurred to me that us adopting an insect-based diet would be both environmentally sound and ethically responsible. I quite agree, Chris. In fact, I've got a delicious Mapani worm right here ready to go. Well, I'm delighted to hear it. Here's to our new lifestyle. Ah. Mm. Uh. Mm. <laughs>
How much spit does the average human produce in a lifetime? Is it A, enough to fill over 500 bathtubs, B, enough to flush a toilet with, or C, just enough to pour over your cereal at breakfast? The answer is A, enough to fill over 500 bathtubs. That's nearly 40,000 litres of spit. We'll never hold back in showing you gross stuff. So prepare your eyes for blood-sucking gross stuff. This is Investigation Ouch. This is a leech, and it's a type of worm. Whereas we only have one brain, a leech has 32. And while we have 32 teeth, a leech has 125. Their main diet is blood. And in fact, right now, I'm providing lunch for this one. Whilst it's on my arm, it's going to eat five times its own body weight in my blood. That's the equivalent of meeting a small cow, hooves and horns and everything. It's not just greedy, it's disgusting. But these wrigglers can actually save human lives, all by sucking our blood. To get drinking, this leech has bitten me, and now its saliva is working its way into my veins, releasing a chemical which will thin my blood, preventing it from clotting. And it's this ability to get our blood flowing that surgeons use in modern medicine. So let's say you chop off the end of your finger. A surgeon can attach the finger, but if blood clots have formed inside the bit of dead finger, new blood can't get in and it will fall off. What doctors can now do is attach a leech to the tip of the finger and the same chemicals that allow my blood to flow into the leech on my arm dissolve the clots and allow fresh blood to enter the reattached finger. There's no fancy machine or drug that can do this job as successfully as a leech. And with such an important medical role, leeches are bred on a massive scale. So while this one has a good feed on me, let's go and meet some more. This is Carl Peters Bond. He's a leech breeding king and is currently housing 30,000 of these wrigglers. How do they breed? Well, the leeches are a male and female, so they can fertilise themselves. Sort of boys in one section, girls on the other, and then they sort of breed together. So when two leeches mate, they both get pregnant, which is pretty extraordinary. And wait till you meet their babies. This is a leech nest. When the leeches lay their eggs, it looks just like white foam, and then it settles down to a sort of a sponge. So this is made by the leeches, and you can just see the clear space at the top, and then the leeches have settled to the bottom. I'm just going to cut the lid off. It is full of wriggling leeches. This is like the world's worst Easter egg, isn't it? Yeah. That's so fascinating, I'm completely distracted from how disgusting it is. And I'm completely distracted with the fact I've still got this enormous leech feeding off my arm. What's going to happen when he's full? Uh, well, it's just going to drop off, and then the hole it makes will just keep oozing blood for 10 hours. 10 hours? Great. No one told me that. That would have been nice to know. Well, after an hour and a half on my arm, it's finally full. And you can see how it's got the blood in my arm flowing. This is the point. If you've cut your finger off, if the surgeon's reattached the finger, it's the chemicals that are now making me bleed that allow new blood vessels and new blood to flow into the reattached finger. They may be greedy, they may be frankly disgusting, but it is that that means they are the most amazing healers. And you can see how much it's grown. It really is five times bigger. I got quite attached to that, literally. Coming up next, it's... Coming up next, it's... What are you doing? Nothing. Coming up next, it's Investigation Ouch. Gotcha. Now, this place may look like a hairdresser's, but it isn't. They're getting rid of lice. They're very common. I've had them. And no matter what anyone says, they're not dangerous, and they don't care if your hair's clean or dirty. They just love to live in it. You can use special shampoos to get rid of these troublesome parasites, but this girl has come for the five-star treatment. Meet 11-year-old Courtney. What's it like to have lice? I've had them four times and they're really irritating because you're always scratching your head in the middle of school lessons. My mum's always told me not to worry because you can always get rid of them. Well, that's good advice from your mum. Lice are totally treatable. Before they go any further, I'm going to have a look at what we're dealing with face to face. Crikey! Now, they may look icky, but lice are very common. Studies have shown that as many as one in three children are likely to get head lice during the year. So how do we get rid of them? 
Meet Justine Armitage. She's a head louse's worst nightmare and she's got a rather special technique. We'll hoover Courtney's hair with a specialist lice hoover. Did she say lice hoover? A specialist lice hoover. That's affirmative. For every live lice there is, we'll catch it in the filter so we can count how many there are. Is it quite fun doing it? Is it quite satisfying? Yes, yeah, quite mouth-watering when you see lots. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what we can suck up. Make sure you get into the corners. After a thorough treatment, how's Courtney coping with being, uh, hoovered? Nice. She likes. Time to see what Courtney's bonds has been keeping secret. So we've managed to catch several lice, and you can see them crawling around in here. So why do lice love hair so much? Well, it's warm, it's near a blood supply, your scalp, which is what they feed on, and they can also anchor their eggs to hair, which means they're very safe and well protected. Your hair is the perfect environment for hair loss. Lice make you feel itchy because they poo on your head. Now that's disgusting, but it isn't dangerous, and in fact it's quite useful because it's the itchiness that lets you know you've got them. Now we've caught the adult lice, but the next step is to find the eggs. A special fine tooth comb is scraped through Courtney's hair to remove them. Let's see how many we've combed out. Oh, you've got loads. One louse can lay a hundred eggs at a time. They're also called nits. A week later, they'll all hatch into lice and those lice just keep breeding. So at the end of the month, one louse has become a thousand head lice. Just as well we've got these guys out. How are you feeling, Courtney? Fabulous. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's head lice. And they're not dangerous, but they are unpleasant. But there are other things that live on your body. Let's investigate. So I've come to see entomologist Vince Smith from the Natural History Museum. So Vince, lice aren't the only things that live harmlessly on our bodies, are they? No, that's right. We've also got this other parasite called a Demodex mite. And with these, the older that you are, the more likely you are to have them. So let's see if we can find some. Vince is scraping the skin around my eyes to try and collect enough gunk to test, but he doesn't get much, so we go into my ear. A good pile of gunk on there, so let's see what we can find. I'm sort of hoping he doesn't find anything. Vince is looking through the microscope, and I can see everything he sees on this screen here. <laughs> You're loaded. Oh, look at that. Oh. Oh. Wow. It's moving. Absolutely. That just came out of my ear. That's fantastic. What does he mean, fantastic? Who is this guy? In the daytime, those mites are living inside the little follicles of your hair cells. And then during the nighttime, they come out and they're moving around trying to find all their mates. So every night, there's a bit of a party in my ear. These mites are pretty disgusting, but actually they're not doing me any harm. In fact, they're useful because they help clean the gunk from your ear. We're carrying around all of these passengers, and this is just the start. There are many other human parasites that we've got too. But remember, don't worry, if you ever get lice, it's quite normal and treatable. I've had them. Plus, we all have other little creatures living on us, helping us out with things like the cleaning. Nice work. But they better not keep me up all night with their partying. How much skin will you shed in your lifetime? Is it A, enough to sprinkle on your fish and chips, B, enough to fill a two-storey house, or C, none, or you'd look like a skeleton? The correct answer is B. You shed 30 to 40,000 dead skin cells every minute of every day. But don't worry, your body continually makes new ones too. What's that sound? Can you hear that buzzing sound? No, I don't know what you're talking about. Seriously, there's buzzing everywhere. Perhaps this is a case for... Investigation Ouch! Yes, this is a room full of flies, and no, I haven't had a bath in weeks, but we're not going to talk about that. If you're wondering what these flies have to do with modern medicine, I'm about to tell you. This is Kerry Jones, and he's a fly breeder. Yes, you heard right, he breeds flies. Kerry, 
How many flies have you got in this room? We've got 36,000 flies in this room. Do you count them all? Every single one. <laughs> and I bet he knows all of their names. What kind of flies are they? They're the common green bottle, same as you'd find in your house or your garden in this country. But these flies are growing up in a completely sterile, bacteria-free environment, and they're eating a very special dinner. Mmm, yum. What we've got here is a big box full of flies eating raw liver. Disgusting. But there is a point to it. Why? The reason we're feeding them on raw liver is to build up their strength so they've got enough strength to lay the eggs, because it's the eggs we're interested in. Flies lay eggs, and the eggs hatch into larvae or maggots like this one. Hello, beautiful. And it's the maggots that have a special medical use. But before we get to that, those eggs have to be harvested. It's basically a manual process. It's removing the eggs from the liver. They're extremely small, and there will be between 10 to 20,000 eggs in each dish. Yes, this white stuff is thousands of eggs all stuck together. How long has this piece of liver been in there? Yeah, about two hours. So in two hours, 600 flies have laid 20,000 eggs. Yes. That would be impressive if it was chickens, wouldn't it? <laughs> And these fly eggs, little worm-like larvae hatch, these are maggots. Nice. Now, you've probably seen maggots before, and these are the same scary maggots that you see in dead animals and in horror movies. <coughs> but there's one really important difference. These maggots are sterile. These are superhero maggots. Being completely germ-free means they can be used in hospitals for a very important job, to clean dead skin away from large wounds, allowing them to heal. So these are... Nice maggots. Kind of. In here, there's a foot with a wound with 500 maggots in it. Let's go see them in action. Not if you're squeamish. Prepare to look away, but not yet. This is Roz Thomas. She's a foot doctor or podiatrist, and she's going to be tackling this. It's a foot with a nasty wound on the bottom of it and a sock, so it's still all right to look. Maggots have been on the wound for two days, and now it's time to see what they've done. Get ready, people. Hopefully they've had a good feed now. Hopefully we'll see a nice, clean wound. Prepare yourself. It can look a bit icky. And there we go. Are you looking? Cleaned up quite a bit, not completely. And they're still quite lively there. They're our little blind, legless surgeons that help to clean up all the mucky tissue. So they're very precise surgeons? They're very precise surgeons, yes. Take a closer look. Although they can eat dead flesh, maggots don't have any teeth. They vomit powerful chemicals onto the wound, which dissolves dead flesh, and the maggot can then eat that, along with any bacteria that are around. And that is what makes them perfect wound cleaning machines. It's looking so much better than it was originally, because it was completely covered with yellow mucky tissue. Yes, it was, but that yellow tissue was all dead flesh. So although it might look worse now, are you still looking? In fact, it's much healthier. This patient's wound has improved a lot in two days. But don't worry, the maggots won't eat the healthy flesh, only the dead stuff. No one's going to be eaten alive. So that's a relief. We normally think of maggots as eating rotting things in bins, but it's this ability to just eat rotten flesh that makes them such good healers. Whereas a human surgeon might have to amputate a foot, 500 blind, tiny, legless surgeons are able to eat only the dead flesh and therefore save the foot. 